Since childhood, the geography of Israel and Palestine has been burnt into our minds. Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Jericho, Hebron, names we are familiar with from school and history. We're also familiar with them from news reports, but with Syria and the terrorist threat now dominating headlines coming out of the region, Israel and Palestine have fallen off the radar. While politicians, diplomats and journalists are focused elsewhere, the situation facing people living through this long-running conflict continues to worsen. 2017 marks the 50th anniversary of the war that defines the modern and highly contentious geography of the region. Since 1967, Israel has militarily controlled much of the West Bank, land the international community recognizes as being the basis of the intended Palestinian state. Fifty years on from that war, people in the region continue to live a daily reality of occupation, segregation, restrictions of movement and violent conflict. And as we approach this anniversary, I travelled with international aid agency Troker to Israel and Palestine to see how the lives of people in the region have been affected by 50 years of conflict. We are not equal, we, are not, we don't have the same rights, so this is apartheid, this is obvious apartheid. She go out to the street, throw some shock grenades, knock on some doors, make some noise, run to the other corner of the street, invade another house, wake up the next family, and that's basically how you pass your eight-hour shift. There's ongoing blockade, there's deepening poverty, there's rising unemployment, and there's no hope. This is occupation, this is wrong, this is a violation of what I believe in as a rabbi from my Jewish tradition, it is a violation of international law. This big elephant is in the room and nobody uh, sees this elephant and nobody wants to see the elephant, and the elephant is the Israel occupation most of the Israelis don't care about it, have no moral doubts about it, have no question marks, and don't deal with it at all. One of the oldest cities in the world, Jerusalem, is also one of the most contentious. With some of the holiest shrines in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity located just yards from each other, Jerusalem's old city is thronged with tourists. But while history attracts tourists into Jerusalem, it has also trapped the city into a bitter power struggle. In 1948, the State of Israel was created. Jerusalem was intended to be a shared capital for both Israel and an envisaged Palestinian state. But since the 1967 war, Israel has ruled both Israel West Jerusalem and Palestinian East. Jerusalem's old city, is one of the most hotly contested square miles in the world. Tension is never far from the surface. Not far from where tourists soak up the sights, I found a small group of women protesting outside the district court of Jerusalem. The mother and friends of 16-year-old Muhammad Abu Qadir gathered. Muhammad had been abducted and burned to death in a local park. His murder is believed to have been a revenge killing by right-wing Israelis in retribution for the murder of two Jewish teenagers, all part of the depressing cycle of ongoing violence and bloodshed. The man accused of Muhammad's murder, Yosef Hayem Ben David, was found guilty by the Israeli court and sentenced to life in prison. But the 50-year occupation stretches well beyond this ancient city since 1967, Israel has occupied the majority of the West Bank, which is internationally recognized as being Palestinian land. I wanted to go beyond Jerusalem and see what life is like for people living under full military law. Following the outbreak of Palestinian violence in 2002, Israel began construction of a wall to divide the West Bank from Israel. This wall has had the effect of cutting Palestinians off from Jerusalem. In Bethlehem, I watched as thousands of Palestinians queued to get through the checkpoint which divides them from the city they view as their capital. I met Amin Jabrin, who owns a tea stand at the checkpoint. He explained to me that the people queuing were the lucky few who have been granted permits to cross into Jerusalem. 
My name is uh, Amin Jibreen, my age 35. This is the main checkpoint in Bethlehem 300. The first man who come to this checkpoint every morning, me at 2 o'clock a.m., I come here to sell coffee and tea for the worker who cross to Jerusalem. Every day more than 6,000 to 7,000 workers cross this checkpoint. They work in, uh, in Jerusalem. Most of the people, they work in construction. And they are lucky people because they have bare mission. Because if you are in Palestine and you have bare mission to work in Jerusalem, you are lucky man. When fully completed, the wall will stretch for over 700 kilometers. Although supposedly the dividing line between Israel and Palestinian lands, it does not follow the internationally recognized border. Instead, it cuts and slices through Palestinian land. Close to the village of Bat Jala, I watched as another section of the wall was erected. This area is recognized by the international community as being Palestinian. The wall, however, will leave it on the Israeli side. Palestinian farmers who have farmed it for generations will no longer be able to access it. Israel says this is for security. For local farmers, however, it is simply a land grab. One day we just discovered that a lot of army and like soldiers and Israelis come in here to uproot all the olive trees. And we are talking about an ancient olive trees, like 1400 since the Roman uh, time. So we came to cover and to see what's happening. And we find out that the Israeli uh, planning or they start to implement uh, a plan to separate uh, this area and to confiscate this valley and to add it to, you know, like uh, to Israel. And of course, a lot of international activi activists and a lot of Palestinians, we came here and we were demonstrating for like weeks and weeks. And uh, of course, a lot of tear gas, a lot of shooting on the activists. And we couldn't, as a people, an activist, uh, to stop their project and their buildings here. All the time, we were able to come here and to, to work, to cultivate our trees and our fields. Now we will not be able anymore. Now we are like filming what's happening. And the soldiers up there, if you see, they are calling us on the mic, saying we need to go and to leave uh, this area. But he just said, yeah, just go behind the wall, which is just built now. And he said, this is Israel now. Like, you can't be here anymore in our side. I told him, like, I've been here, like, maybe before you come here, and you know this area. Like, I, I've been, like, coming here and work here in this valley since a lot of years. You don't know the valley, like, as much as I know it, and you can't just tell me, go out. He said, yeah, but this is orders, and I'm just, like, implementing the orders. The wall is just one way in which Israel is gradually confiscating Palestinian land. Throughout the West Bank, Israel continues a plantation project aimed at populating the area with its own citizens. Today, there are an estimated 600,000 Israelis living in settlements dotted across the West Bank. These settlements, built on Palestinian land to home Israeli citizens, are illegal under international law. Directly behind me on the top of this hill is the Israeli settlement of Gilo. So these settlements, like Gilo behind us here, are essentially commuter towns in the satellite of Jerusalem. So a lot of these residents will live in very Western style uh, houses, some of them with swimming pools, uh, with first world services like uh, electricity and water, and will be connected via access roads to Jerusalem. So many of the residents would commute maybe 10, 15 minutes into Jerusalem and the houses will be subsidized uh, so it's cheap housing, they get tax breaks, and many would consider themselves not settlers, but living in neighbourhoods of Jerusalem. The, the only problem being that this isn't Israeli land, this is Palestinian land, this is confiscated Palestinian land. So these settlements are built on occupied territory. So these settlements are illegal under international law, and so the residents living here are contributing to displacement of Palestinians and ongoing violations of international law. While Israel builds huge settlements throughout the West Bank, it simultaneously makes it increasingly difficult for Palestinians to build on their own land. Israel has divided the West Bank into three areas, one under full Palestinian control, one under full Israeli military control, and one under mixed control. 
the Palestinian Authority has been granted control over certain urban centres, all of which are ringed by areas under Israeli military rule. It has created a situation eerily similar to apartheid South Africa, with Palestinians living in cantons disconnected from each other. Any Palestinian living under Israeli control must obtain a permit to build a house, but only 15% of permit applications from Palestinians are successful. Many Palestinians refuse to move and instead build homes without permits. They live under constant threat of demolition. In one such community, I met with Abu Yushay. كانت العائلات قليلة في الأيام هذيك يعني فصار نبو نمو طبيعي نمو طبيعي للسكان وانجبرنا إنه نتوسع يعني اللي بده يتجوز اللي بده كذا بده يبني له بيت فالإدارة المدنية منعت إنه نقيم بيوت في هذه المنطقة من حتى الأيام هذي من الأيام هذيك لحتى أيامنا هذه يعني سرنا نبني بركسات من الزينكو مثل هذول البركسات يعني لأنه بدنا نعيش ف يعني من هذيك الأيام لأيامنا هذه كل سنة كل ست شهور في عندنا هدم يعني هدم للبركسات هدم للبيوت تضييق يعني من كل الاتجاهات من أربع اتجاهات هاي مستوطنة على فكرة المستوطنة هاي بالستة وثمانين قامت بالستة وثمانين الجدار من الجهة الجنوبية الشارع من الجهة الغربية وشارع من الجهة الشمالية فإحنا يعني سرنا في النص يعني تسكير ما يعلم فيه إلا رب العالمين مشاكل ثانية اللي بتتعلق بالسكان بالتجمع إنه يعني عدد كبير تسعين في المية من السكان بسكنوا بصرفان من الزينكو وهذول الصرفان معنا بالصيف حم وبالشتاء برد خمسة وثلاثين بيت عندي ثمانية وعشرين اختار Muhammad's home was raided two years ago at 2 a.m. Israeli soldiers kicked in the door, let off shock grenades, yelling and pointing machine guns at the family. Muhammad's son was then 12 years old. The trauma that night had a profound effect on him. He lost the power of speech. Two years later, he still cannot talk. I was taken aback and saddened by what I had seen, but I wanted to hear the other side of the story, so I met with Emmanuel Nashon, head of press at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In those areas which are under Israeli control, we do not allow people to build without a permit, yes? You can't build anywhere, everywhere, just wherever you feel like building. It doesn't work that way, and it's not about Palestinians or Bedouins, it's about everybody. Why do you think that a, a, an Israeli would be able to build something without a permit? Of course not. It depends whether you really want to build something for yourself or whether you are trying to create a provocation. And my feeling is that some of those building in initiatives which unfortunately are also supported and financed by EU member states. Their only purpose is to create a provocation. What we see is a situation in which EU member states and the UN actually give a de facto support to people who are building illegally. Even within Israeli society, a vocal minority questioned the policies of their government. I met one such critic who is not only Israeli, but also a rabbi. Rabbi Arik Asherman opposes home demolitions and settlement expansion. Our work ranges from legal work in the Israeli court system to uh, return land to Palestinians, to prevent homes from being, Palestinian homes from being demolished, to, to prevent takeovers, to work with the international community, uh, which has been in, in crucial for keeping these people in their homes uh, when there is an intense uh, drive and push by the state of Israel using all of its power to move these people out of their homes. And sometimes it can be on the ground work, physically accompanying uh, the farmers when they are harvesting or the shepherds uh, or getting to their trees or whatever has to be done so they can do so safely. Rabbi Arik's work brings him directly into conflict with the Israeli state and with settlers. Even his status as a rabbi offers him little protection. 
on a recent routine visit with Palestinian farmers to an olive grove, Rabbi Arik was attacked by a masked settler who threatened to stab him. He was lucky to escape with his life. Despite violent confrontation, he is still determined to speak out in support of Palestinians facing home demolitions. We visited one such community where he has campaigned to keep the bulldozers at bay. Fatima and her family and the other families of Susia are still in their homes today. And that's not something that should be taken for granted. And yet they are living by the skin of their teeth, uh, scraping out a living and not being able to fully live in dignity on their own land because of all the intense pressure being applied in every imaginable way by the state to get them eventually to move. It becomes a human rights issue when, in the name of a negotiating position, agree with it or disagree with it, you try to basically expel people from their homes. And that's what we have down here. This is occupation. This is wrong. This is a violation of what I believe in as a rabbi from my Jewish tradition. It is a violation of international law. Close by, Rabbi Arik brought me to another community who are waiting for a date in court to appeal against the demolition of their home. We're here in a small village, a community called Tarek in the south Hebron Hills. And we've come here today with Rabbi Arek. And he's negotiating on behalf of the community here to prevent this house behind me being demolished. They're in court tomorrow morning. And the homeowner says that if this demolition order is carried out, they'll have to return to living in tents. But they had to build without a permit because they had a new family and they couldn't get a permit. Now he's asking, what would you want to tell the judge? What are you going to do if you come and demolish your home? Uh, I'd like to tell the judge, before you were a judge, you were a little boy or a girl. And then you grew up. And then you got married and you built a home. And we're the same. Would you agree that someone would come and demolish your home and leave your children without a roof over their heads, uh, exposed to the elements and to the sun? You may be a high court judge, but you're also a human being. And you should understand that from your human feelings that we just want to live and and, and, and have normal lives here. The difficulties Palestinians face in gaining building permits also extends to other resources. According to Human Rights Watch, not only are building permits difficult or impossible for Palestinians to obtain in 60% of the West Bank, Palestinians also have limited access to water, electricity, schools and other state services that are readily available to Israeli settlers. Water is among the most contentious resource. I visited one area where locals say their traditional water supply has been rerouted to serve settlers. We're here just outside Jericho at the Alusia Spring. This, as you can see behind me, is a dry spring bed where before water flowed freely all year round. That is until 1967 when the Israelis came in here and built this pumping station behind. And now the pumping station pumps an enormous amount of water from here, depriving the local Palestinians of water for their agriculture, water for their homes, and it goes directly to the settlements. The Palestinians can get some of the water back, but they have to pay for it. The charge is hotly contested by the Israeli government. Israel does not steal water from the Palestinians and we certainly do not stop the possibility of water coming to Palestinian towns and villages. We have the possibility to bring fresh water which can be used uh, for agricultural purposes, for industry purposes and even for drinking uh, to Israelis and to Palestinians. We do not discriminate. The different treatment given to Israeli and Palestinians living in the West Bank shocked me. Even the legal system people live under is defined by their ethnicity. Israeli settlers living under civil law, while Palestinians are subjected to military law. But I'd seen nothing yet. If people in rural areas suffer discrimination, the city of Hebron takes it to a whole new level. Like Jerusalem, Hebron is claimed by both Israelis and Palestinians. Although located deep in the heart of the West Bank, Israeli settlers claim the city. To defend them, the Israeli military has shut off the historic center of the city to Palestinians. We met Israeli writer Gideon Levy, 
whose weekly column for Herat's newspaper often highlights human rights abuses in the West Bank. If you want to see the Israeli apartheid in a nutshell, go to Hebron. There's no other place in which you can see it in the most crystal clear way. I mean, when a whole community is expelled from, its, from their homes, thousands of people from their shops, when you live in a ghost town where there is only, almost only Jews living there after all the Palestinians had to leave out of fear because of the threats that they were living under and the violence that was uh, implemented against them and because of the army. If you see streets which are allowed only for Jews and roads which are allowed only for Jewish owners, what is it if not apartheid? Yehuda Shaul knows these streets well. As a sergeant in the Israeli Defense Forces, he patrolled them nightly. He says that his orders were clear, to disrupt the lives of Palestinians in any way possible. The IDF is supposed to protect the people who live here. Our orders as soldiers on the ground are very different. We are told we are here to protect the settlers. If we see a settler attacking a Palestinian, not our job. That's the job of the Israeli police. So I stand in a post, and I was standing in a post, in dozens of times. Right in front of my eyes, settlers are beating up, are throwing stones, are breaking windows, are cutting electricity lines to a Palestinian house, and my orders are not to interfere. The concept in the IDF is that if Palestinians will get the feeling that the Israeli army is all the time everywhere, they'll be afraid to attack. So what do you do to make them feel this way? You make your presence felt. And everyone, you have three patrols, that that's their job, to make their presence felt. You start your night shift patrol, 10 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the morning, you choose a random house, the officer, the sergeant who leads the patrol. I was a sergeant leading these patrols for a while, yeah? Bump into a house, wake up the family, men one side, women the other side, search the place. You can yourself imagine the dynamics, what happens when a military unit bumps into your house at two o'clock at night. Finish searching the place, you go out to the street, throw some shock grenades, knock on some doors, make some noise, run to the other corner of the street, invade another house, wake up the next family, and that's basically how you pass your eight hour shift. My uh, deputy company officer threw a tear gas canister on a Palestinian kid, three, four years old, in a balcony, eating watermelon, because he was collecting intelligence against us. Yeah, the guy was this size. He was having a competition with his radio guy whether who can fire a tear gas canister into a Palestinian home while the family is inside under curfew, cannot leave. A sergeant in my company yeah. killed a Palestinian young man with a rubber coated bullet to his chin from around 10 meters away. Shaul's actions in Hebron eventually led to him questioning the Israeli military's presence in Hebron and throughout the West Bank. He went on to establish Breaking the Silence, an organization of former Israeli soldiers who now campaign against the occupation of Palestinian land. The turning point for me was towards the end of my service. I was based outside of Bethlehem, and I was suddenly able to see myself in the mirror. We basically started having these conversations about things we've done and seen, and the one thing we kept bumping into was the realization that people back home in Israel have no clue. You know, like, our own society is sending us here to do the job, so to speak, without understanding what doing the job means. So we decided to bring Hebron to Tel Aviv. That was our slogan. Yeah, We wanted people back home to know what's going on. The Israeli occupation is not in the Israeli discourse. People know very little about the occupation. People don't know about the occupation, don't want to know about the occupation. Most of the Israelis have never been to the occupied territories, and they couldn't care less. And in June 1st, 2004, we opened a photo and video exhibit in Tel Aviv. We were 64 people from my unit. Our photos on the walls, our faces in the screen with video testimonies about what we've done. We became the story of the country for the week. If you would come to me 12 years ago when we started and tell me that today I'll be sitting here after about 1,100 soldiers broke their silence, I would probably laugh in your face. And here we are, after 1, 000, about 1,100 soldiers broke their silence understood what they've done. Yeah, stood up in front of the mirror, sat himself in the mirror and took a stand and broke the silence. And their story is now up here in front of our society demanding from us as a society to take responsibility. That's for me the most important thing. Today, Shaul works with the very Palestinian communities he once ruled over. Among them 
is Abel Rahman Samalia. My name is Abd Rahman and I live in this house. This is my house. This is where I live. If a settler came to my house and attacked me in my house, if he went to the police station and said that I attacked him, by the law, I'm guilty until I prove the opposite. So by the law, I will, I will go to jail and they are innocent until not I prove the opposite, but the police proves the opposite. The Palestinians who are living here, they are all under the, the military law. The settlers who are living here, they are under the civilian law. We are not equal, we, are not, we don't have the same rights. So this is apartheid, this is obvious apartheid. I live in Hebron in an area called Tal Urmeda. It's really, really hard and difficult to live next to, to the settlement. I was, in, uh, I was 10 years old when I started school here in this area. From 10, 10 years until uh, maybe 18 and, and it was the same, like it was all attacking. They attacked us physically, uh, they throwing stones, they throwing uh, dirty water, eggs, anything you imagine, they, they can't do anything you imagine. I'd never seen anywhere like Hebron before. A ghost town filled with the pain of people who had been evacuated. It was eerie to walk down its empty streets. On one of the streets that is off limits to Palestinians, I met an Israeli settler who lives in the city. First of all, welcome to Hebron. Uh, it's the first historic Jewish city. There are many Jewish livers here, and they're not settlers. We're not settling foreign land. This is our land. We lived here before the establishment of the state or anything like that. So we are the indigenous people here. I'm not saying there aren't other people that lived here for years. Um, and I wish we can go back to the day, the way it was beforehand, where we lived side by side with true, real peace. There's organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, who mask themselves as human rights or whatever they want to call it, which use it as an agenda to spew that hate and that violence and keep it going, because if us and the local Arabs work it out, then they don't have a reason to exist. His words echoed those of official Israel. Israel continues to, to build settlements, and then the UN have recently said that the settlements, I'm just quoting this, are in direct violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which forbids an occupier from transferring its own civilians into the territory it occupies. Well, we have a disagreement. We have a legal disagreement with the UN. And you don't agree with the UN on that? No, 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 no. We do not agree on that statement at all. And the reason is the following. We do not consider this land to be occupied land. We have demonstrated time and again that when there is real peace, we are willing to uproot settlements. We have done it in Egypt. We have done it unilaterally in the Gaza Strip. The settlement blocks, which are most of them, or all of them rather, in the vicinity of the Israeli border, are meant to stay under Israeli sovereignty. But what we have discussed with the Palestinians some years ago was the possibility of a territorial exchange. We see uh, the, the activity of settlement building as something which is not against uh, international law mm -hmm. and something with, that needs to be discussed together with the Palestinians. But if the conflict in the West Bank is a gradual and systematic one, the situation in Gaza is more upfront. 41 kilometers long and 12 kilometers wide, Gaza is a tiny self-governing territory that is home to almost two million people. With both Israel and Egypt having locked its borders to all but a select few, the majority of Gaza citizens are trapped. It has become effectively the world's largest open air prison. Not only are they denied access to the outside world, people in Gaza have to endure regular wars between Israel and the ruling Hamas government. During the most recent conflict in the summer of 2014, over 2,500 people in Gaza were killed after Israel launched a full-scale military offensive in response to Hamas rocket fire. Among the dead were Mohammed and Kalde El Selek Sajaz, three children. When we came to the morning, I found the child and the seven children, all of them were dead. When I found the only one that I found without any injuries in the head, this is my brother, Abdul Halim. I said, 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 على اساس انه عايش بعد ما اديته لابن عمي على اساس يودوه على الشفاء ينقذوه طلعت كمان مشوار ثاني اخذت عبد العزيز كان راسه من هان مفتوح حملته ونزلت فيه 
وديته لاخت مرتي كان لسه في نفس بس حتى في حاجه من مخه وقعت وانا بحمل فيه وطلعت مشوار ثالث قلت بدي اشوف اجيب امنية ما ما شفتش الهراس ما قدرتش قلت خلص بس ينزلوها بانزل انا على ضليتنا على باب الدار استنى فيهم ينزلوهم عشان نودعهم من حاجه لما اجى الاسعاف لقيت لما ضربوا البيت ضربوا البيت حسيت يعني الضربة عندنا في البيت طلعت على الطابق الخامس توقعت اني الاقي انه اولادي عايشين انه القزم يعني توقعت ما يكونش على السطوع يكونوا في الطابق اللي تحت شويه طلعت فتحت هذا لقيت طلعت دغري على السطوع لقيت بقول لك حمايه وسبع اطفال كلهم اللي ما لهمش راس اللي مستشهد على المطر كلهم يعني كانوا مستشهدين يعني جثث سامده برك دم لقيت انا كل بس اني طالعه المنظر هذا كمان ما رجعتش بعد وعي انه كان انتصار كله على اولادي طلعت لقيت زوجي ما ياخذ ابني الوسطاني لقيت ضلت البنت بتطلع ما لقيت لهاش راس لما شفت منظر ما لهاش راس نزلت من غير وعي على الدرج يعني مثلا بعد فجاه هيك بعد اسبوع انا ليش ما رحتش على الشفاء اللي اودع اولادي اللي قبل ما يروحوا يدفنوهم يعني الواحد كان غير وعيه يمكن الواحد شويه شويه بدا يتاقلم يعني وهذا يعني رضت ربنا والحمد لله امنيا كان عمرها 8 سنين عبد الحليم 5 سنين عبد العزيز 3 سنين Muhammad would also lose his leg in an attack minutes later as he was carrying a body to the ambulance. بقول لك بعد اسبوع انه اليهودي قال اعتذروا انه مش احنا مش قاصدين دار السلام. لحقوق انه ندافع انه بدنا حقنا وزي كذا حق اولادنا لهبقول هم اصلا الصغار هذول هم كانوا يضربوا علينا قذائف صواريخ. ايش هذول الصغار هم بيعرفوا صواريخ ولا شيء لا طبعا. يعني عشان يحطوا اللوم على تعاوننا. It was very moving hearing these bereaved parents speak with such stoicism and dignity. Sadly, their story is far from unique. On the 10th day of the conflict, an Israeli missile hit the house of Talal Muhammad al Halo's brother. كلهم راحوا في البيت بس سواء مع الأرض الحمد لله هذا قدرنا وهذا هذا ما قتلته القوات الجيش الإسرائيلي أطفال عمره أراء ست شهور ست شهور سنة سنتين الأب والأم ولا واحد فيهم في مقاومة ولا واحد فيهم عسكري ولا واحد فيهم لا حماس ولا فيهم فتح ولا في جندي ولا في اي ان اي علاقه بهذا الشيء قتلوا اطفال ونساء ليلى الهالو lost her daughter during the war طول الليل هي بتراسلنا تسال على يا ما كيف انتوا اقول لها يا ما احنا بخير الحمد لله رب العالمين طول الليل حد اول اللي رهيب تسال علي تطمن علينا اقول لها يا الحمد لله بخير لا حد تقريبا الساعه 3 3 الا 5 بالضبط اخر مكالمه لها كلمتني هي اخر مكالمه لها كانت الساعه 3 الا 5 ساعتها بعد تقريبا 3 الا 5 وقع الدار على على البيت عليهم صرت ارن عليها جوالها يرن بس هي ما فيش حد صار ابني يطلع من الشباك يشوف لقى بيته بال Israel maintains that these wars are the inevitable result of Hamas aggression. There is no doubt that Hamas and other militant groups are guilty of war crimes by indiscriminately firing rockets into Israel. Human rights groups and the international community point to the disproportionate response of Israel. During the 2014 conflict, approximately 1,500 Palestinian civilians were killed in Gaza, compared with six Israelis. The chair of the United Nations Independent Commission of Inquiry warned that the extent of the human suffering in Gaza was unprecedented and will impact generations to come. Despite the massive civilian casualties and international condemnation, 
The Israeli government maintained that they are fighting a war on terror. Hamas will use whatever it can in order to try and hurt Israel, even if the price is hurting their own population. There is no better way to describe Hamas. It's a bunch of Islamic hoodlums who have taken them over. It's a dictatorship. It's a bloody dictatorship. Imagine the, the following dilemma, and those are dilemmas that we have been facing every day. A group of Hamas people start shooting rockets or mortars from a schoolyard. Do we shoot back? Don't we shoot back? Whatever we do, it's bad. Walking through Gaza's streets, the impact of the ongoing blockade and cyclical violence was obvious. One in every two people in Gaza do not have enough food to eat. A third of the population are reliant on food aid. Basic infrastructure such as water, sanitation and health services are crumbling at the seams, while the unemployment rate at 42% is one of the highest in the world. Even its fishing community is denied access to fishing grounds that would enable them to earn a decent living. Fishermen can sail only a little over five kilometers from the coast. Many claim that Israel denies them even this limited access. Generation after generation now, uh, what grows in Gaza is a huge, huge human tragedy. Even the UN declared that uh, by the year of 2020, Gaza will not be a place where human beings will be able to live. And uh, it's unbelievable how the world is watching it and does nothing about it. Sister Bridget Thai from Sligo has lived in Gaza since early 2015. She says that the biggest problem here is not violence or poverty. It is the complete loss of hope. I have a background in nursing and midwifery and management and I speak a bit of Arabic and I know the Middle East. So I feel that I can bring something useful to the people here. What I saw at the beginning is what anyone can see, the poverty, the broken homes, the children on the streets. But as I get to know the people, that's when I hear the other things, the hopelessness, the fear for the future. Their children, six years old, have lived through three wars. So they're traumatized, they're clinging, they're crying, they're bedwetting. There's a lot of violence, domestic violence, because the people are traumatized. So the longer I stay, the more I see, and I actually feel it in myself, the hopelessness that is pervasive in Gaza. With the help of organizations such as Trokra, 
Sister Bridget delivers medical care to children in Gaza. One of the biggest issues children face is trauma. Ola Dweek, a child psychologist who works with Sister Bridget, explains. So we've known these people for two or three years. Some of them lost their homes, some of them took in other people, and we've seen them grieve, try to get their lives together, try to move on, try to look forward. But look forward to what? You saw the number of children. What's the future of those children? Sister Bridget's assessment was sobering, but it was also accurate. When you speak with people in Gaza, you can feel the hopelessness. The United Nations has questioned the short-term viability of Gaza, warning that by 2020, many basic services will have collapsed. I wonder what chance there is of peace when young people in Gaza are being raised in an environment where they have a limited future. Such a situation plays into the hands of the extremists. Israel has legitimate security concerns due to the presence of armed groups who deny their right to exist. And by condemning all of Gaza's people to inhuman lives, they succeed in swelling the ranks of these groups. Without political movement, the cycle of violence seems destined to continue. I've just spent two days in Gaza, an extraordinary experience. I'm here in a caged area between Gaza and Israel. It's no man's land. We pass through two checkpoints down there, Hamas, Fatah, Palestinian checkpoints, back to back with Israeli checkpoints. It's like nowhere I've ever been. It's an open air prison, 1.8 million people surrounded by a wall on one side and by the Mediterranean Sea on the other. And that sea is constantly patrolled by Israeli gunboats. We have met people who have been devastated by the war. Families who have lost up to 11 people. Children with horrific injuries. Having spent time in Gaza and the West Bank, it was very difficult to come away feeling positive. The conflict seemed so intractable, so deep and so ingrained. However, there are voices for peace. Before I left, I had a chance to meet a group of Israelis and Palestinians who worked together. Combatants for Peace is an organization of former soldiers and militants who have joined together to call for peace and justice for all. I joined them outside of Bethlehem on their monthly rally in the shadow of the separation wall. Combatants for Peace, which is a joint organization of Israeli and Palestinian who took part in the circle of violence, which means Israelis who participated in the army, a Palestinian who sat in the Israeli jail and said, we are not longer willing to continue the violence, the, the circle of violence. We don't want our children to live in this, in this kind of an environment and we're willing to do something today 
in order to ensure that our children will have a better chance to live here. The only way to end this conflict is to talk together with Palestinians who are non-violent. I used to live a few years in America and I, I just felt I can't represent um, my, I felt almost ashamed being Israeli because when you're outside you, you see how Israel looks from the outside and it's uh, so hard. So when I came back I became more active in the issue of occupation because I feel that when we're here we have to do what we can to change this. During my short time in Israel and Palestine, I met several Israelis who shared the view that the time has come to end the occupation and deliver a lasting peace. These activists remain a minority voice, but there are signs that their numbers are growing. In April 2017, two former heads of Israeli's powerful domestic intelligence service claimed that the ongoing occupation was destroying Israeli society. Ami Elion and Carmi Gillon warned that the occupation was putting Israel on a path of incremental tyranny. It is a view shared by Dov Kennan, a member of parliament who has gone as far as accusing his own country of engaging in ethnic cleansing. The problem in Israel is not that people so much like the current situation. The most important problem is that most Israelis do not see an alternative. Most Israelis, you know, in principle, were willing to have a two-state solution, to have an independent Palestinian state alongside Israel. The problem is that the right wing in Israel succeeded to persuade the majority of Israelis that this solution is not possible. The current situation is not a situation, a frozen situation. It is a deteriorating situation. Uh, the fact that occupation is continuing and the fact that many, many people, Palestinians and Israelis alike, are losing hope, this is, you know, by itself very, very dangerous because people without hope can do very, very bad things. After hearing so many stories of despair, it was inspiring to see people from both sides of this decades-old conflict coming together and calling for solutions. U.S. President Donald Trump has met both the Israeli and Palestinian leadership and has vowed to make peace in the region his foreign policy legacy. Whether he can achieve that remains to be seen. On May the 27th, 2017, over 15,000 people gathered in Tel Aviv under the banner, Two States, One Hope. They called for Benjamin Netanyahu's government to do more to secure the two-state solution, many see as being key to securing lasting peace. A message from Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas was read during the demonstration. The time has come for you and us to live in peace and harmony. We have accepted the decisions of the UN. We recognize Israel and accept the two-state solution. Now the time has come to recognize the state of Palestine. Israeli opposition leader and Labour Party leader Isaac Herzog addressed the rallies. This week we saw an American president who is determined to bring peace between us and the Palestinians. We must put aside ego and connect a large political bloc that gives equality to minorities and is open to a variety of opinions. There are no easy answers to the situation in Palestine and Israel. Peace will be difficult to find and even harder to secure. What we do know is that blockades, land seizures, house demolitions and segregation will not bring peace to this land. It seems to me that these policies will only further drive the Palestinian and Israeli people apart. Ultimately, peace can only happen by people working together to find compromise and solutions. Only then is there a chance for everybody in this troubled land to live with the dignity and peace they all deserve.